Dear Father, we want to thank you tonight for the Word of God, which is alive, which is powerful, which is sharper than any two-edged sword, which pierces to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and which is the thing which alone has the ability to criticize our hearts and our intentions. Father, I really do thank you for your word, that by it we know whether we are walking aright with our God. Father, I want to pray for us as a fellowship tonight, Lord. Father, I know that your desire for every group of people is that we may show the world how to live together, how the life and the love of Jesus is manifest between us, and that above everything else we might study to be quiet. Father, you know that Satan will cause ferment in this world, but we know that you want to produce in your body the type of peace that the world needs to have. Father, we need, I know, Lord, to really see what your word is declaring to us. Father, I do pray in the name of Jesus that you will anoint everyone in this meeting tonight with the Holy Spirit and with power, that, Father, we might have the discernment to understand those things that you're saying to us. We thank you for prophecy, Lord. We thank you that you've given us prophecy, that we might have hope and we might know where we stand and where the world is going. Father, I pray tonight, Lord, that you will anoint the words that I have to speak so that we might really know that you have been the minister here. And Father, as we deal with these things together, I pray, Father, the thrill of Jesus should be in our hearts and in our minds as we know that these things are not fables, they're not cunningly devised stories, but they're the absolute truth. It's history written before the event. Oh, Father, just bring the thing to life tonight, Lord. Father, that we might see and understand and be thrilled because we know that our God is a God who reigns in heaven and on earth. Praise your wonderful name. Oh, Father, just take us and use us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Having now cleared all of the details that we need to know about the tribulation, I'm ready to actually give the uh, story of the tribulation from beginning to the end. And tonight we're going to begin peacefully, and at the end of tonight's Bible study, we're going to have armies facing one another across a very large valley indeed. Before I begin, however, going through the period of the tribulation so that we bring everything together, I want to remind you of two things which are very important. All right? The first thing is this. The political situation at the time of the tribulation is totally different from the political situation we find today. Today we have two superpowers, right? We've got Russia, we've got America, we've got the Eastern Bloc and we've got the Western Bloc facing one another, and we tend in our day to think in terms of those two power blocks. When the tribulation comes, that will not be the political lineup of the earth. Now, how the political lineup changes and how it happens so rapidly is not the subject of tonight, but in the Bible study after next, when I deal with does Russia have a future, we're going to understand just how the events described in the tribulation come about as far as the earth is concerned. So that's the first thing to remember. One, the political situation of the tribulation is not like our present political lineup. And the second thing, and I remind you of this, we've seen it before, is this. The Holy Spirit does not act in the tribulation to restrain evil. Now, he's still around and people still get born again, but he as the restrainer is removed. Now, this means that things of a sinful nature happen far faster than they do today. Whatever Satan plans today, it takes a very long time for it to come into existence. In those days, there'll be no opposition. Satan will have his way, at first, anyway. You see? And we've got to get that clear in our thinking. Otherwise, we, we tend to think, well, how could this happen? It couldn't happen today. No, it couldn't, because today we've got the Holy Spirit restraining evil. In those days, all the restraint is removed. Now, with those two things in mind, we can start going through the tribulation. All right. If you've been to all the last few Bible studies, 
when I begin tonight, there should be nothing new to you. You should actually know all of this already, and that's why we're going through it fairly rapidly. The tribulation itself is a period of seven years which begins after the church has been removed from the earth, the so-called rapture. The church is removed, the Holy Spirit in his restraining power also is removed, and that marks the beginning of this period that we call the tribulation. The period itself lasts for seven years and can be divided into two sections. The first three and a half years, which are fairly good, there's a fair amount of peace on the earth, and the last three and a half years then, a total of seven years, which Jesus described as the worst time of tribulation that there will ever have been in human history. And then, after the seven years have run, it finally ends with the second advent of Jesus Christ, when Jesus physically and literally returns to the earth. Now there is the tribulation period. Let's begin just after the rapture. You remember, we saw this last week, just after the rapture of the church, there is a, a lull before the storm. There is a short period of quietness in which 144,000 evangelists, who are all Jews scattered around the face of this earth, suddenly realize that Jesus is not only their Messiah, but is also their Savior. And they are born again during that time. Not only born again, but then an angel comes and he seals them with the seal of the living God. Meaning that, of course, Satan can't infiltrate their minds, Satan can't infiltrate their lives, and they are fully equipped for seven years of evangelism. And as soon as they are sealed, these evangelists get in, out into the world and start preaching the gospel to every creature under heaven. So that uh, they start in their own local area, and then they gain converts, and those converts then go out, and so it carries on. Now, as soon as they are sealed, the judgments of God begin on the face of the earth. God declares holy war against the unbelievers right here, and against the characters who are the political leaders in the tribulation. At first, his judgments begin slowly. In fact, in the first year, almost imperceptibly. But as the time goes on, the momentum builds up and the force and severity of these judgments build up until by the last three and a half years, the earth is almost unrecognizable as the same earth that we live in today. All right, now this is how the tribulation goes through. God's judgments being upon the face of the earth. When the tribulation opens, the political scene is very different from the scene today. Dominating the scene is a group or confederacy of nations, mainly around the Mediterranean area and the European area, which actually have come together and they are forming an alliance so that they may have prosperity uh, in this region of the world. These ten nations decide to come together, and as soon as they decide to come together, one man stands out as the obvious leader. Right? This man who we call Antichrist, or who is called in the Bible the beast, or the man of sin, or the son of perdition, they're some of his names, he immediately wants to take control and dictatorship of this ten-nation confederacy. The world is amazed when it sees these ten nations coming up, because as soon as they arise, they suddenly realize it's nothing but the old Roman Empire come back to life. All right, so Antichrist decides that he wants to be dictator. As soon as he puts himself up as the dictator, seven of the ten nations accept it instantly. But three rebel. And they say, no, we won't have this man to rule over us. And, and you remember, we saw this at the very beginning of the tribulation. Antichrist declares war on these three nations. He invades them, takes them over, and then he is top dog of all ten nations. Now that's how the tribulation begins. He is so successful uh, in running these ten nations that soon the whole world begins to think of him as a man with the answer to all the world's social and economic and um, agricultural problems. In fact, the whole of Europe comes into such prosperity that the whole world starts looking at Europe. In the world generally, Satan now begins to move 
in order to establish a one world government, a united world government. Do you remember when we saw the Tower of Babel? We saw that this is what they wanted at the Tower of Babel. Man to control the destiny of all the world without reference to God. As soon as the Holy Spirit as a restrainer is removed, so the plan gets into action. And the people of the world meet, we don't know where they're going to meet, and they decide they're going to put the whole of world government under one figure. And who's the obvious figure? Well, they look to Europe and there he is, the man who has been so successful. They say, you are the man who has the, the ability to uh, stop famine, to deal with all social unrest and all social un injustice. Will you come and will you be dictator, not just of re the revived Roman Empire, but also of the whole world? And this man, Antichrist, before very long, right at the beginning of the tribulation, is set up as a world dictator. Right? And he is the supremo, as I would call him, of all that Satan wants to do in the world system. This same man, by the way, is the man who at the beginning of the tribulation establishes a trade agreement with Israel. Little Israel will still be there, isn't it wonderful, despite all the foes that oppose her. She will still be there at the beginning of the tribulation. And Antichrist undoubtedly makes a lot of alliances with a lot of nations, and Israel's one. Now, Israel has certain things that Antichrist wants. The Dead Sea, you know, has fantastic resources, and they're more or less untapped. Today, I suppose they get a few minerals out of the Dead Sea, but generally they haven't exploited it to its fullest extent. I understand the Israelis are about to make it into a giant battery, you know, to produce electricity. And, of course, it's so saline, actually, that it will be very good as an electrolyte in a, in a battery. And that's what they're going to do. They're drilling for oil at the moment. They're drilling for gas. There's sulfur deposits in the sea itself. There's magnesium. There's phosphates, um, which, of course, are, are very good as fertilizers. There's bromine and all sorts of other chemicals. Now, Antichrist wants these. He's going to begin the most fantastic social programs you've ever seen in your life the most fantastic agricultural programs you've ever seen. The whole world is going to declare him to be saviour, and he needs phosphates. So, he says to Israel something like this. Well, you give me the phosphates, you give me some of the wealth from the Dead Sea, and you know, Israel, I'm going to save you the bother of having to have your own army. I'm going to look after you as far as your defence is concerned. I'm going to save you millions of dollars as far as, or whatever currency the Antichrist is going to work under, hope it won't be the pound, right? But millions of these things, shekels. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be your defense for you. And Israel says, what a very good idea, and they enter into a seven-year agreement with him. All right? Now, this is part of the plan. Everything looks absolutely fine as far as Antichrist is concerned. But gradually then, what happens? Very gradually, God begins judging the earth. Now, do you know, when God starts warring against the earth, his weapons are not people. His weapons are things like the sun, meteors, hailstones. He'll cut off the rain, right? He'll blot out the sun for the, the harvest season. And he does things like this, earthquakes, volcanoes. These are the weapons that God begins to use. And, of course, it's not long before the harvests that Antichrist is so proud of begin to fail. And, well into the tribulation, famine breaks out, you know, on the, the, the land. Let's have a look at a scripture that we've seen before, just to show you that this is the case. Turn with me to Revelation 6, and let's just read verse 5, where we have the third seal. You all know what a seal is by this time. All right, the third seal. Uh, verse 5, this is a picture of famine in the tribulation. Right? And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hands. These were balances used to weigh out grain. And here it is, and I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny. A penny was a day's wage. One measure of wheat for a day's wage. That's how much there is. In other words, grain is so short that it has a tremendous price on it. 
and three measures of barley for a penny, and see, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. In other words, the luxuries are untouched, but the basic necessities of life, they are in very short supply indeed. Now, Antichrist, of course, realizes that things may not go his own way. And so, he's rather clever because he employs the force of religion in the tribulation. And you remember, in the tribulation, we see the rise of a second man who we call the false prophet. And the false prophet is the head of the apostate church of those days, right? There is going to be a church, but it's not the church of Jesus Christ. We're gone by that time. And this apostate church, for example, would not believe in the virgin birth, would not believe in the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I think it would involve totally with a social program. But, because the Holy Spirit's gone, it has fantastic power at its disposal. And this man, the false prophet, promotes a religion centered around Antichrist. Very powerful, this. You see, he's using man's natural desire to have a God, and he's centering it around the person of Antichrist. And during the first three and a half years, this false prophet, plus all the other lecturers that there are associated with this apostate church, are lecturing and they're actually saying, you've got to start worshipping Antichrist. He is the saviour of the world. You must start devoting yourself utterly to him. And you remember that the false prophet starts putting up statue to Antichrist in all the religious places around the world and people start worshipping. These statues are empowered by Satan and they do miraculous things and the false prophet himself does miraculous things. He can call down fire from the sky, for example. All right? And for three and a half years, it seems to spread just fine. But trouble is brewing, because after three and a half years, all of a sudden, the uh, false prophet decides it's Israel's turn to now have this religion. And so he goes to Israel, and in the middle of the rebuilt temple, he puts up a statue to Antichrist. It's called the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies, he sits up this uh, statue of Antichrist and it's the beginning of trouble. You know what happens, don't you? Do you remember? The believers who see it remember Jesus' words and they rush to the hills. They're getting out, right? They've only got a little time to do it. The other Jews in the land refuse to bow down and worship this statue. And they know full well, Antichrist will be after them. They are defenseless. They have almost no weapons at all and they know Antichrist will be determined to put down the rebellion. So what do they do? They start rushing into the cities. Now, up to this time, you should have known all of that. All right? I'm now going to concentrate on this last three and a half years because this is absolutely vital. Antichrist, immediately he sees the Jews rebelling, he starts sending his army out to the Middle East. He is going to quash this rebellion. All right? And we're going to now see the battle campaign of Antichrist and trace it right through to a dreadful battle which comes just before the second advent of Jesus Christ called the Battle of Armageddon. Before we do that, and before we turn to the passage that deals with it, let me just say this. During the tribulation, God is going to use the sun as one weapon against the earth. Now, as you probably realize, the sun has fantastic power within it. And occasionally today, there are things called solar flares that occur. And suddenly, a sort of um, a branch of the sun, as it were, will, will rise out of the surface of it, and a sort of tongue of fire will go deep out into space. Or there are sunspots that appear on the face of the sun. Whenever this type of activity of, occurs, it produces a type of radiation which affects the earth very badly. Even today, you know, our communications are disturbed by solar flares. Have you ever heard it? The BBC say we apologise to listeners or to viewers up in the north of Scotland. The, the loss in transmission was due to circumstances entirely outside our control or beyond our control. When they say that, they're not meaning, you know, that the IRA has blown up a tower or something. What they mean is that the sun's radiation has interfered with the waves. Now, 
a little later on, we're going to see a passage that shows us some of the solar activity that goes on. It is so amazingly uh, powerful in the tribulation that all radio communication is interrupted. Now, have you ever thought what that means? People read the book of Revelation, they read passages that talk about solar activity. Have you ever thought what it means? You see, most of our modern weaponry now uh, exists because of extremely complex electronics, you know? Printed circuits. The missiles that we use, they depend entirely on, on gyros and things like this. They depend upon radio waves. Um, guns today are, are electronic, you know, the type of weapons that are used and are coming into use, they have printed circuits in them now. Tanks have printed circuits in them. You think of the aircraft that fly, the aeroplanes that fly around the world. All of them have fantastic electronic circuitry. They depend on radar. They depend on radio communication. What is God going to do? It's going to be thrilling. As soon as he starts uh, stirring up the sun, all of a sudden these people who've spent millions and millions and millions on defence suddenly going to find they're all useless. You know, no one in their right mind would set off a rocket knowing that there's solar flare activity around because all the rocket would nicely do is go berserk about, uh, you know, a hundred feet up and just plunge down to earth again on top of the people who send it off, <laughs> you see. And suddenly, halfway through the tribulation, they're going to find not one rocket will be fired anywhere in the tribulation. Not one aircraft will get off the ground anywhere in the tribulation. There's going to be no aerial bombardment. They're going to find all their tanks completely kaput. And the trouble is, the new research and technology that will be necessary is going to take so long they won't stand a chance. Now this means that in the tribulation, the battles that are fought are not like the battles of today. The battles are downgraded. In other words, they have to go back to the old things that they've used in the past. Horses will be used, for example. Much more reliable when there's solar flare activity around, you know. Just not affected so much, you see. They will, of course, use ships to transport their armies. But you see, when you're talking about battles, therefore, in the tribulation, don't think of the highly armoured divisions that would uh, be true of us today. No, no, no. It's going to be much slower all the way. And they're going to find they're totally disarmed. Isn't it wonderful, by the way, to know that God can stop a nuclear holocaust, right? Simply by saying to the sun, come on, I want a bit of activity from you. And the sun says, yes, sir, and off it will go. <laughs> and there's no nuclear holocaust whatsoever. God is in control of all of the realms of nature. Absolutely thrilling. Now, bear that in mind when we come to these passages. All right. Turn with me then to Daniel and chapter 11. Daniel and chapter 11, and let's see the development of this. All right, Daniel chapter 11, and the verse I want to go to is verse 36. Daniel 11, 36. Now remember where we've reached, all right? Where we've reached is this. Israel has rebelled against Antichrist, Here's the coast of Israel. Antichrist is now sending troops by sea across to the Middle East. Now, some things start happening. Here's Israel, defenseless. They're now all in their cities. All right? And Antichrist is coming, and he's coming fast. Here's what actually happens. Now, in Daniel 11, verse 36 onwards, we have a very interesting passage. Remember, please, that Daniel 11 is the most detailed prophetic passage in the Bible. Do you know it gives such detail that historians are absolutely amazed when they, they read it? Absolutely fantastic. Bible critics look at Daniel 11 and they say, that cannot be prophecy. It is so accurate, it is so detailed, it is impossible that anyone could have known the detail that's in Daniel 11. So they always say, well, it must have been written after the event, you see. And the last event described before Jesus Christ came was about 150 years before Jesus Christ. So they say it must have been written about 150 years to 200 years before Christ. Has to be. Well, it doesn't have to be, praise God, because it happens to be written by God who knows the end from the beginning, you see. It's so detailed, you know, that very few Bible teachers ever try and tackle it, you know. I've never heard this passage preached on. Uh, Daniel 11, 1 to 35. I will give you that pleasure one day. Do you know why? 
because you have to know so much about the history of the Middle East that it takes almost an hour to deal with every two verses. Because you have to explain uh, who Ptolemy was, who Ptolemy the third is, who Antiochus the second was, who Seleucus the third was, and so on. You have to trace it right through. Now, up to verse 35, we know the history that it's describing. That's easy. But the interesting thing is, from verse 36 to the end, there is nothing in history that relates to it. Now, when we see that in a passage like this, what do we know? We know that it's referring to a time which is yet future. And from verse 36 to the end, we have a description of what occurs in the tribulation period. And if you want to know where the church is, why the church is a mystery. And if you see the little white space at the end of verse 35, that's where the church is. You have 2,000 years of history missed out at that particular point. All right? Good. Let's begin then verse 36. And here in verse 36, 37, 38, and 39, we have a description of Antichrist. Let's just quickly go through it. And the king, this is Antichrist, shall do according to his will. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. Whichever god it is, people will be told, desert him, Antichrist is a better god. And he shall speak marvellous things against the god of gods. The word marvellous is the Hebrew word for miraculous. In other words, he won't only say, God is not God, he will actually say, no, and to prove he's not God, I'm going to do a miracle for you, just to show that he's a counterfeit, you see? And he's going to start doing miracles in the land. Signs in the heavens, all sorts of things are going to be done in his own name against our God, our wonderful Father in heaven, right? And then it says, and he shall prosper until the indignation be accomplished. In other words, until the end of the tribulation. For that that is determined shall be done. And that little bit at the end of verse 36 simply means, it's a little bit thrown in by God who says this, by the way, he'll prosper until I decide he's not going to prosper anymore. That's what God says. And when my plan comes to an end, so he's going to come to an end. All right, so God is in charge. Verse 37. Now, we saw this verse last time. This is the verse that many people use to show that Antichrist is a Jew. Let's just read it. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Now, in this phrase, the God of his fathers sounds Jewish, and this thing... Uh, this little phrase, the desire of women, always means the Messiah. And specifically with us, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Now, whenever that phrase is used, the desire of women, for example, it's used in 1 Samuel 9, and in Haggai 2.7 it's used, it always means the Saviour who is coming, the one who is coming to save the country, the nation, whatever. All right? And people say, ah, this shows he's a Jew because he rejects even the desire of his mother, you know, and the desire of all Jewish women to bring forth the Messiah. Remember that Jewish women today don't know that Jesus is the Messiah, and so they're still hoping to give birth to the Messiah, you see. He rejects all of that. He rejects the Messiah completely. And he won't regard any God. He will exalt himself above all. By the way, other people who say, no, he's not a Jew, would say he, that simply means he's rejecting his former religion. So, rejecting Christianity or rejecting whatever religion he, w he happened to have before him. You remember last time I said that we need to know a few more facts before we can be definite about this. Certainly, there is one Jew uh, in the tribulation who is used by Satan, and that is the chap who makes the trade agreement with Antichrist at the beginning of the tribulation. He's used anyway. All right? So, uh, let's wait and see, and let's wait for God to give more guidance on that. Right, verse 38. Now, in verse 38 and 39, you've got a terrible translation. Verse 38, But in his estate shall he honour the God of forces. Now, the phrase, in his estate, simply means instead of these gods, or in his place. Right? So instead of worshipping God, what does he do? He shall honour the God of forces. And the God of forces, 
literally means that the word forces is weaponry or strength, military strength or battles. In other words, he is going to say, listen, he, he's going to say, I have the power to defeat everyone. Right? And it's satanic power that's behind him. He's going to honour the satanic power, you know, of armaments, the satanic power of military warfare and things like this. He will live for military warfare. He won't try and convince his enemies of anything. He will simply say, if you don't do that, I'm going to invade. Full stop. You see? And then it goes on, and a God whom his fathers knew not, shall he honour with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. And that, of course, refers to the religion of the tribulation. Right? This is a type of religion the fathers didn't know at all. And he will pump money into the spread of religion. I'm going through these very quickly because I want to get on to the battle. Right? Verse 39, then, is very, very badly translated indeed. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange god whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. And the best translation I found is in the NIV. So could I just read it to you? And it's more or less self-explanatory. The NIV of Daniel 11, verse 39. Antichrist will attack the mightiest fortresses with the help of a foreign god. In other words, the strongest nation he's not going to be afraid of, and with Satan's power, he's going to move against, against them. And will greatly honour those who acknowledge him. All those people who are on his side are going to receive uh, great honour. Indeed, there'll be generals, there'll be leaders, there'll be uh, counsellors, magistrates, all of the titles that you can think of. He will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land, literally, for a reward. There it is. And so he'll say to people, right, you've served me well, you can have a nice villa by the side of the Black Sea, right? Or a Bogna Regis, or wherever you want a nice villa. This is going to be my reward. Now that's the type of man Antichrist is going to be. A military man above everything else, although he is a political genius. All right. Now verse 40. Now from 40 to 45, we have the battle. Notice his his navy is beginning to approach the Middle East. Now, as soon as it starts, look what happens. At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen, with many ships. He shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. There it is. Now, as soon as he's approaching, some of the countries of the Middle East start getting stirred up and start rebelling against him, right? Remember that uh, they're a bit disillusioned, you know, the famine's beginning to hit, and they're looking for an opportunity now to rebel against him. And as he approaches, first of all, the king of the south shall push at him. The word push means like two rams with their horns entwined, and they'll start pushing at Antichrist. The question is, who is the king of the south? Fortunately for us, we don't have to look very far. Because if you read the first part of Daniel 11, why the king of the south mentioned about six times, you know? And I, I, I think uh, the verse, well, I could go through them, but, you know, verse 5 is where they begin, and you trace them through in Daniel 11. Now, who is the king of the south meant in the first part of Daniel 11? Why? It's Egypt. And the thing is, it's still the same at the end of Daniel 11. It's still Egypt. So as soon as, as Antichrist starts heading towards the Middle East, Egypt says, aha, we're not having you come near us. And they start mobilizing their troops, you see. And as soon as they do that, then another country gets a good idea. You see, it spreads, you know. And look what it says, uh, about halfway through verse 40, and then the king of the north shall come against him. Now the question is, who is the king of the north? At this point, you always get certain Bible teachers, and I did for years, say, this is Russia. You see, this is definitely Russia. Well, now that's rather interesting, because you see, like the king of the south, the king of the north is mentioned many times in the beginning of Daniel 11. Many, many times the beginning of Daniel 11. Shall we just see a few of them? Go to verse 6. And in the end of years they shall join themselves together, for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north. 
There's the king of the north. Verse 7, halfway through, and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north. Verse 8, right at the end, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. And so it goes on. Verse 11, verse 13, verse 15. The king of the north, the king of the north, the king of the north. Who is the king of the north? Is it Russia? Oh, no, no, no. Russia was unthought of in these days, you see, except for the Scythians. They quite liked it up there. No, it's not. The, definitely not Russia. Who is it then? Well, who is the king of the north? It's Syria. And the king of the north refers to Syria and Iraq and these nations north of Israel. These are all local. Now, as soon as Egypt then rebels, Syria says, now's our chance. So Syria starts gathering together, and they start pushing at Antichrist. They're not having him in their land either. Now, when Antichrist comes, he's faced with these two rebellions. Israel's no problem to him. They're not armed. So what does he do? He does something interesting. He sends a little force to keep the Israelis pinned down, right? And then he sends his army up to deal with the king of the north first of all. And in this area, in the king of the north, he starts fighting against uh, their armies, and he doesn't just leave it as in one battle, he then goes into the northern area and he clears up all the resistance against him in the north. He leaves Egypt for the moment, just going, you see. Egypt obviously isn't as strong as these people, so the first thing is his army comes across a little force into Israel to hold them down, the rest is sent to the king of the north to deal with them. Now, as soon as they are dealt with, what does he do? Well, now he goes down to deal with e Egypt. As he goes down to deal with Egypt, he has to pass through Israel, right? But Egypt is who he's after. Now, let's see this. Right, the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, they're the mobile forces, with horsemen, they're the cavalry, and with many ships, that's the navy. And he shall enter, Antichrist this is, and Antichrist shall enter into the countries, shall overflow and pass over. Now this means not just one country, into the countries up north, right? He goes into them, he fights, and he passes right through them. Now that's his battle against the king of the north. The king of the north is defeated. Verse 41, he shall enter also into the glorious land. Now what's the glorious land? The glorious land is Israel. And so, on his way from the king of the north, he passes through Israel. Doesn't bother with Israel at the moment. He's more interested in Egypt. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. Do you remember why? Because your beloved brothers and sisters are hiding away up in those hills. And here they are in the hills of Moab, Ammon, and Edom. And these are protected from the hand of Antichrist. So he charges now straight down to the south. Verse 42, He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. And the reason that's in there is that while he's up campaigning against the king of the north, Egypt thinks that uh, they're winning. You know, they're just fighting against a little force. But Egypt shall not escape. For Antichrist does a complete turnabout down through Israel into Egypt. Right? So now he enters into the land of Egypt. Verse 43. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. And this phrase just means that in these days Egypt is going to be very rich. Indeed, a very rich land. You may be interested to know that in the last two years there's been an economic miracle in Egypt. Everyone's talking about it. They're absolutely staggered. A country which was poor has suddenly become rich. And we know why, don't we? Because they're blessing Israel at the moment. And obviously it continues, because um, here they are, and they are now, at this point in the tribulation, a rich nation. And he comes into Egypt, he invades the land, and takes over all of their riches. Now, before going back to Israel, he then looks at the countries around Egypt. And he thinks, they're going to cause me some trouble. So I'm going to deal with them as well. So, look what he does. The end of verse 43. The Libyans, these are to the west of Egypt, and the Ethiopians shall be in his steps. 
So he goes to Egypt, he goes first of all over to Libya, deals with them, back to Egypt, down into the Sudan, which is the largest African country, you remember, and then on into Ethiopia. Do you see that in the days of the tribulation, these aren't quick battles, this whole campaign is going to take him years, you see, at least two, getting on for three years. That's what it's going to amount to. All right, he's having a wonderful time, now deciding whether he should go and deal with other countries, like Somalia, you know, and uh, Uganda, and, all, and Kenya, and all these other nations. And he's having quite a good time. The Jews are no problem to him. But all of a sudden, something happens that upsets his plans. Go to verse 44. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Here is Antichrist. He's down in Ethiopia, down here, with most of his army. All of a sudden, he hears about trouble in the east and trouble in the north. And he says, I've got to deal with this, you know. Undoubtedly, the king of the north has rallied a bit, but that's not what the main problem is. We're going to see what the main problem is in just a few moments. Tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore shall he go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. He does a U-turn down in Ethiopia and he zips up north as fast as his horses will carry him. And up he goes, back through Egypt, across the Red Sea, into Sinai, and up into Israel, the land of Israel. And in verse 45, we read uh, about where he puts his military headquarters. All right, now let's, let's see this. Here is the land of Israel. Here's Jordan. Here's the Dead Sea. Draw it down there. All right? And here is Jerusalem. Oops. There is Jerusalem. Just there. Verse 45. After he's done this journey, he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace. The tabernacles of his palace, by the way, refer to his headquarters. This is his military headquarters. Now, where does he put it? Here it is. Between the seas, so it's between the Dead Sea here and the Mediterranean Sea there. And then, uh, and the glorious Holy Mountain. So it's going to be between the seas and the glorious Holy Mountain. The word in, by the way, is the word and there. So between the seas and the glorious Holy Mountain, this glorious Holy Mountain is Mount Zion. So his military headquarters are going to be just outside uh, Jerusalem. Made Israel a bit too long. There we are. Now this is very clever. Do you know why? Well, you see, this is a very defensive position. You can't be, a, he won't be attacked from up south because he's already defeated the Egyptians. And no one in their right mind will try and come across directly from the east. He's got the Dead Sea to protect him, you see. So he knows that by putting his headquarters there, the only way the attack is going to come is from the north. Do you know, by the way, that whenever uh, enemies of Israel who lived to the east of Israel wanted to attack Israel, they never came in from the east. Over in the east, you've got desert, you've got mountains, and you've got the valley of the River Jordan. If you tried to come in that way, you'd never win the battle. Ever, ever, ever. It's quite impossible. So do you know what they did? They always went up north and came down from the north. This is why in Ezekiel, by the way, when Ezekiel is describing the attack of Assyria, Assyria was to the east, to the east of Israel. He doesn't say, oh, I see trouble from the east. He never says that. What does he say? I see a seething pot from the north, he says. And many, many people who study their Bible scratch their heads and say, how come he sees it from the north when Assyria is to the east? That's the answer. Whenever the enemies from the east came, they didn't come from the east, they always came from the north. They went right round the top. They avoided the desert, they avoided the mountains, and they avoided the River Jordan. So there they are. All right, now just at the end of verse 45, yet he shall come to his end, hallelujah, and none shall help him. Now that's a statement just to tell you God's in charge of everything. The question for us is this. What is this news from the north and from the east 
that stirs him up so much. Unfortunately, the Bible tells us what it's about. So let's turn to Revelation chapter 16 and we will see the news that he is going to hear. Revelation 16 and I'm going to begin verse 8 to show you the solar activity that occurs at the time. All right, beginning verse 8. I'll just read this through. It's quite obvious. This is a, a tremendous solar activity. And the fourth angel poured out his vial, Revelation 16, 8, upon the sun, and power was given unto the sun to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. Staggering reaction. You see, absolutely amazing. Men will not believe, not because God hasn't shown himself, but because they refuse to believe. And we, it's true in our day too. They won't believe. You see, then verse 10, epidemic hits. The fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. Now verse 12 is the verse that interests us. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. Here is the river Euphrates in Iraq and it's east of Israel. A direct attack is made on the river Euphrates and look, and the water thereof was dried up. Why? That the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now here's a reference to some kings called kings of the east. Do you know, by the way, the king of the north is never mentioned in Ezekiel and never mentioned in Revelation? That's staggering, you see. De no, he's just a local king. But the kings of the east are mentioned. Who are these? We don't know who they are, quite. You know? But I think this is an oriental, a pan-oriental block that revolts against Antichrist. They start moving their armies across. In these days, it takes them a long time to get mobilized and a long time to travel. I wouldn't be surprised if China's not in this lot, if India isn't there, you know, if Afghanistan isn't there, even Japan. We just don't know. But they are moving across to come and join in the revolt against Antichrist. And because time is running out, God helps them. Remember, these people think they're going to gather together for battle. But oh no, it's God gathering them together. And he is going to be the one who will finally oppose them. And across they come, that they suddenly find the river Euphrates has dried up. It's easy. No pontoon bridges to build or anything like that. They just trundle straight across the plain. And they head up north to come down from the north into Israel. There they are. And the whole of the way is prepared before them. Now let's see what happens. Oh well. Here are the kings of the east, and they're coming from the north. Now, can you see, Antichrist is at Jerusalem, and his army, therefore, will begin moving to the north in order to meet the troops coming down from the north. You see? You'll notice, by the way, the Jews are hardly affected at all at this time. Undoubtedly, while they're waiting for the kings of the east, they start attacking Jerusalem, but we know, don't we, that uh, the troops just take over the outer, uh, the outskirts of Jerusalem. They never get into the core. What's happening in the core? Why Moses and Elijah are preaching the gospel in the core. Hallelujah. And they'll still be there. And then the army suddenly has a task to do. And leaving part of the army at Jerusalem, he moves his army up north to greet the other armies that are coming down from the north. And somewhere to the north of Israel, those armies are going to meet. If you go to verse 16, here's what it says. And they gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And we've got to understand where this is. Very often if I'm drawing a map of Israel on the board, I will draw it just as a straight line. But actually, if you look carefully, it's not a straight line. There is a little promontory 
or a little headland that actually sticks out. It's near the port of Haifa today. The port of Haifa. And if you look at a map, find the port of Haifa, you know the promontory that I'm referring to. Now let me just tell you a bit of the geography of the area. That promontory is part of a hill range which runs inland in a southeasterly direction. And it's called the Mount Carmel Hill Range. <coughs> to the north of that hill range is one of the largest valleys in the whole of Israel. A valley which um, is called the Valley of Esdraelon. E-S-D-R-A-E-L-O-N. The valley is called the Valley of Esdraelon and it again goes inland in a southeasterly direction. Now, if you follow the valley in on its southern side from the coast, about 15 miles, you come to a town which is called Megiddo, M-E-G-I-D-D-O. And it's from this town, Megiddo, that we get the name Armageddon. Armageddon is Har Megiddo, which is the Mount of Megiddo. And at Megiddo, there is a valley which cuts through the Mount Carmel Range down to the southwest. And this valley goes down to join the coast of Israel further south. Right? And it is where that valley meets the valley of Esdraelon, which is the area we know as Armageddon. So Armageddon then is the area to the south of the valley of Esdraelon. Moving in. There it is. And that is where the battle is going to be. It is in that area that the armies finally meet up. And let's look at these armies. You've got the kings of the east, and undoubtedly you've got the remnant of the army of the king of the north. From the south, you've then got Antichrist's army moving up, and I also suspect that you have the remnants of the king of the south's army. Right? The Egyptian army. What they're going to do, I think, is this. As soon as our Antichrist army moved to the north, they're going to creep up the coast here, and they're going to go through the valley which cuts through the Mount Carmel range. And they're going to move up into the valley of Esdraelon. All right? This is where the most fantastic battle that history has ever known is about to be fought. I imagine that the, 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 uh, the, the forces of Antichrist remain in the Mount Carmel range, waiting for the kings of the east to come down into the valley. And that's why it is in the southern part of the valley that the Battle of Armageddon is actually fought. All right, that's where the main battle is. There is also a minor battle by Jerusalem, because undoubtedly the kings of the east, of the north and of the south, will send some troops to try and capture the headquarters of Antichrist down here. And they will probably creep in surreptitiously through the hills and they will surround Jerusalem to try and take it. Now can you see, this is the battle that actually uh, is waiting for the end of the tribulation. After three and a half years of campaigning in Syria, Iraq and all the nations up north and then moving down into Egypt, into Libya, into Ethiopia, Antichrist has to come back to meet this fantastic challenge. And right at the very end of the tribulation, you have the kings of the earth meeting together in this place. The armies of Antichrist consist of people from all over the world. It is almost as if the armies of the world are met at this place, Armageddon. And I like to think that before they started fighting, they spent some time gazing at one another. You know? And in that period of time in which they are gazing at one another, they have a lot of hard thinking to do. They think the victory is going to be theirs. But the Lord Jesus Christ has a big surprise for them. And for tonight, we're going to leave them gazing at one another. <laughs> and next time, I'm going to tell you what happens on this glorious day, how the Lord himself resolves the battle and, beloved, the most wonderful thing, how he gives them a time of repentance. Even these troops sitting in their war machines, he gives them a time for repentance before he finally produces his last and greatest judgment. Next time, the second advent of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>